Hello and a very warm welcome to Policy Watch, where we discuss major economic events during the week. I'm Maithali Busnurmat and I'm your host for the day. It's been a fairly eventful week, maybe not as eventful in terms of economic developments compared to what we've seen on the political front. But as Bill Clinton, the former US president, famously said, is the economy stupid? So we will be discussing the three major economic stories that dominated the news this week. The first is the consecutive growth in the IIP numbers, the index of industrial production that we saw for the third month in the row. Then we look at the COBRA post expose and the practices prevalent in the banking system. And last but not the least, we'll discuss the government approval on sale of Coal India equity. And to discuss all these stories, joining us is Mr. Paranjoy Guhar Thakurta. Thank you, Paranjoy, for joining me on this program. Let us start with the first story. The first story is about India's industrial production. India's industrial output grew by 2.5% in March 2013, aided by a 2.9% in the core sector growth. Despite a meager 1% annual growth in factory output, we saw three straight set months of growth, and that has brought some cheer to the market. India's industrial output rose for the third straight month, reviving hopes of a turnaround in the economy. The factory output had declined 2.8% in March last year. However, annual growth in industrial production stood at a lowly 1% compared with a 2.9% growth last year. Only 10 out of 22 industry groups in manufacturing sector registered growth in March compared with 13 groups in February when the monthly growth was just 0.46%. The Central Statistical Organization's projection of 5% annual GDP growth for last year is based on an assumption of a 2% growth in industrial production. 1% growth in factory output for the entire year has raised some doubts over the economy's ability to achieve this forecast. Industrial growth was negative for six months of fiscal 2012-13. Emboldened by the March IIP numbers, the Finance Ministry has expressed confidence of achieving 6% GDP growth this fiscal. Bureau Report, Rajasabha Television. Paranjoy, we just heard the numbers of, in, of the Index of Industrial Production. On the one hand, we hear this is the third straight month where we're seeing some growth, 2.5% is not bad compared to last month's 0.6%. On the other hand, we hear that this is the lowest in the past 20 years. Now, how should we look at it? Is the glass half full or is it half empty? You know, it's early days to say whether this is going to be the beginning of sustained recovery of the industrial of industrial production. It's early days. Why? Because of a variety of factors. Now, as you have rightly pointed out, if you look at the whole financial year that ended on the 31st mm -hmm. of March, the growth has been just 1%. Against 2.9% in the previous year. And mind you, that means this is when the world economy was supposed to have revived to some extent. But what is clear is that the recovery has been rather gradual, rather fragile and the situation is pretty uncertain and, and let me say why I'm not that pessimistic. See, one of the reasons you have to also mm -hmm. remember that this growth of the March figure, the of March 2012, there was a fall in output. Yeah. So that base effect has yes. had some impact. Secondly, we see the capital goods sector has not really revived. So, you know, capital goods but is very, very... But it's shown an improvement, 9.5% last month, 6.5% mm -hmm. this month. So, can we look at this as green shoots, Paranjoy, do you, you think? You know, I would be a little sceptical. I would like to look at it that mm -hmm. way, but I'm not so sure. Okay. Why? Why am I not so sure? Why? Because inflation still remains very, very high. Mm -hmm. You know, we've again seen diesel prices being hiked mm -hmm. uh, by almost a rupee. Uh, although petrol prices have come down, but we are seeing inflationary pressure is still very, very strong. Now, what has happened is inflation as a whole tends to suppress mm -hmm. demand at mm -hmm. the same time because it eats into the real incomes of mm -hmm. people. So when the demand of, say, sure. even middle class households for mm -hmm. fast moving consumer goods, consumer durables, they get depressed, mm -hmm. that has an impact on industrial production. So I'd wait and watch. I'd okay. hope that these are okay. the beginnings of change, mm -hmm. but it's early days. There's another reason why things may not be, mm -hmm. you know, again, we're going through a period of political uncertainty. Absolutely. It's a run-up to the elections. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you can't expect the government to mm -hmm. announce big ticket mm -hmm. policy measures. We are seeing the mm -hmm. clarifications that are supposed to mm -hmm. come on this foreign direct investment mm -hmm. in multi-brand mm -hmm. retail. Now, all those things are still playing out. So can you expect a sharp and a sudden revival? 
I'm not so sure. But I hope there's a revival because mm. if there's no revival and if I mean, assuming the monsoon is good this year, uh, that's the only hope that the economy will do better than it did last year. Except that the government had announced a number of policy measures, especially on foreign direct investment. And we are seeing a number of moves by foreign investors to invest in India, whether you're talking about the retail sector or the airline sector, civil aviation. And along with that, we've also seen a revival in exports. Exports in March grew by 7%. And that again is the third month where we're seeing exports show positive growth. At the same time, March is a month when government really did not spend. So as the elections approach, we are going to see government spend more. So even though the private Indian sector, domestic companies may not be willing to really invest, they might want to you know, hold their horses as it were, will government investment not make up for this, Paranjoy? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure for two reasons. Why? is that first foreign investment. Foreign mm -hmm. investment can add best sub supplement domestic investment. Mm -hmm. We've seen the savings rate has also come down a little bit and mm -hmm. so has the investment sure. rate. So it's early days to say whether, mm -hmm. you know, foreign investment can add best supplement domestic investment. Mm -hmm. Government investment, let's see what happens. Yes, that mm -hmm. may to some extent help revive mm -hmm. the, the economy. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, our, when you look at exports, mm -hmm. how sustainable are, is this export growth that we're talking about? <laughs> again, the sharp rise in exports that you've seen in the last mm -hmm. two months are the figures are high because you contrast them with that, very, very poor growth a year ago. Why Why uh, are we uh, spectacle? Why exports, you know, it depends on what's happening in the rest of the world. Absolutely. Europe remains in deep recession. That double deep recession is continuing. And, you know, uh, the U.S. economy, the revival has been slow, has been gradual. As for lo the looking east, you know, China's economy has also slowed down. Absolutely. So a combination of these factors would, you know, mm -hmm. not make it very easy for mm -hmm. India's export sector mm -hmm. to continue. Why? You know, there might be some fallout benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll tell you garments is an mm -hmm. example. You know, Bangladesh has gone through this terrible kind of sure. situation. That may have an indirect impact. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Indian garment exports may pick up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I hope exports mm -hmm. pick up because there are a large number of these labor intensive export oriented mm -hmm. sectors mm -hmm. so it has also an impact on employment in our country Absolutely. but I would be a little cautious mm -hmm. in presuming that this is a beginning of, of, a, trend. of a trend where okay. we are going to see significant changes. So the three months of positive growth you feel don't signify a trend but one positive thing uh, uh, Baranjoy, is it actually if you look at manufacturing? You know, manufacturing has been one of the sad stories of the Indian revival, as it were, because manufacturing is where you're going to see growth, employment opportunities, all that happening. No doubt. And we about desperately that. need manufacturing to grow if we want to remove people out of agriculture. Absolutely. And the correct. plus this time is that manufacturing is grown by about 3.2%. Hmm. So, would you say that manufacturing, which has a weight of 75% in the IIP, we are seeing shoots of revival and this, this is the trend only continues? This is the only hope that if manufacturing revives, that's the only hope for the economy to also revive. But uh, once again, I go back to the point I was saying. At the end of the day, the who, who's going to buy the, buy the goods that are produced by the manufacturing sector? Any. It's going to be the middle classes. It's going to be the upper middle classes. It's going to be even the farmers of this country. Now, if inflation continues to erode their real income, mm -hmm. those... Uh, the, 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 the the demand from these sectors would tend to be suppressed. So we, I think we've entered into a very difficult phase in the economy. Okay. I mean, at one level, I would like to believe the mm. worst is over. Okay. But I'd still be a little cautious because mm. in the coming months, mm -hmm. we're also going to see a lot of political upheaval. Mm -hmm. And that would have an impact on the economy. You know, for instance, will the government be able to operationalize the, the, the right to food act? You know, that, that would matter. Now, that would also have an impact. And that's, you talk about government spending also reviving the economy. Let, let, let's wait and watch. Uh, I would like to be optimistic. At the same time, you know, one has to be cautious because the last 12 months or so have been pretty bad for the Indian economy. Yeah, uh, particularly one of the sectors that was really affected by the political uncertainty and all the corruption stories that were floating around really was the mining sector. That's mining correct. had been performing very badly. And even now, this time also in March, we've seen negative figures. But then it's less negative than in the past. But, and if you juxtapose this with the Supreme Court ruling allowing mining to take place again, and today we've seen about POSCO and ORISA, etc. So do you think the mining sector, which is one of the biggest problems, I mean, we had this crazy situation where India, which is rich in iron ore, we were having to import iron ore once again in the area coal. of coal. That's right. So do you think that these are, you know, like maybe we, we can hope to see some revival happening in mining also. And if that happens, then you're going to see a revival in mining, positive growth in mining, manufacturing and electricity. So positive all around, low positive but nevertheless positives. 
No, I'm not at all confident. And let me tell you why okay. I'm not. Say coal mining. Because coal, coal is the biggest uh, mineral that we, we are... Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the largest it, producers. It, is. I mean, we, uh, it, it accounts for more than half of the total energy that's consumed in the country. Now, what has happened is this whole coal gate scam. What are the consequences now? Mm. You know, these coal blocks that have been allotted, many of those allotments have been cancelled. Some of them have been suspended. Yes. We don't know what's going to mm. happen. Mm. If the court intervenes, we might see more cancellation. Many of these mm. private companies mm. that got these coal mm. blocks, mm. they haven't begun mining. Sure. We see this huge problem where we are importing coal. About 15% mm. of our total requirements mm. of coal we are importing. Mm. At the same time, mm. the new power generating mm. capacity mm. that has been installed mm. is not getting Mm. adequate coal supplies. Absolutely. The whole issue of whether import prices should be pooled, whether you should have a common price for imported coal and the inability of Coal India Limited to okay. give guarantees mm. to the power, power, the, the power plant fuel producer, linkages that's right, the fuel issue. linkages. Okay. See, these problems haven't been resolved. So you're not too and, hopeful, and, and, and Because Parajoy. these problems so, have not been resolved, yeah. that, and, and I'm very honestly, yeah. I don't see these problems being resolved okay. in a hurry. Because at the end of the day, yeah. the problems are very, very okay. basic. So Paranjo, you're not too hopeful on the coal front, but we'll come and discuss more about coal when we discuss the story on coal divestment, which is one of the stories for this, uh, for this program. But now we'll take a short break, but please do stay with us. We will be coming back shortly. Welcome back and now we move into our second story. A second round of sting operations conducted on public sector banks and LIC by news portal Cobra Post has exposed some fundamentally questionable practices prevalent in India's banking system. It is particularly worrisome as some officials of public sector banks this time were caught red-handed. These visuals were recorded in a sting operation conducted by undercover journalist of Cobra Post. The officials were seen advising prospective customers how to launder money, bypassing established norms. Some groups of journalists had exposed such practices prevalent in private sector banks. This expose raises serious questions about the ability of Indian financial system to prevent money laundering and movement of illicit funds. It also raises serious questions about the applicability of Know Your Customer norm laid out by the Reserve Bank of India. The government was swift in announcing action against 31 officials of public sector banks and India's largest life insurer, LIC. Bureau report, Rajasabha Television. Paranjoy, the Cobra post, if you look at it, the second expose, it's like the Cobra stings again. But the second time, it really didn't have the same impact as it had the first time round. How do you look at it? Is it just par for the course? Or is it that we're seeing so much sleaze all around? This just seems like a very minor aberration. Is there something more to it? Or are we kind of, you know, making too much of a mountain out of a molehill? No, I think, you know, there's a certain amount of fatigue because people have got used to all these scams being exposed virtually every day. But I think what Cobra Post has done is very, very significant. In the first round, what we saw were the major private sector banks being exposed. You know, whether it be ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank, Axis Bank. And what was clear that you didn't have to go to Mauritius or Switzerland to launder your black money. Here was a guy who was posing as a representative of a politician, of a politician who had a lot of money to launder. And here were they, the, the officials of the banks were willing to go to, the, to this person's home and tell him, look, these are the services we have to offer. I, mean, I think it kind of reveals a tremendous rot in our system. What is significant about the, the subsequent round of exposés, I mean, there were three rounds actually, the 14th of March, the 5th of April and the 6th of May, is the in involvement not only of all the public sector banks, okay. but also the insurance companies. Yes. And, and what's interesting is that they seem to be working at tandem. And, and what is quite interesting, if you look at certain trends, is that the government actually doesn't scrutinize the source of funds for insurance schemes, especially life insurance schemes. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's one view that bankers put out to Absolutely. the, the they under, said It's not our job to find out whether Correct. the money is kosher or not. Precisely. The source of funds, they say, is not our responsibility. Now, can you really expect banks to find out is the source of money legitimate or not? Subarao, the governor of RBI, has clearly gone on record saying that they don't, do, don't expect banks to check where the money is coming from. They have KYC regulations. As long as those documents are in order, don't blame the banks. Would you agree? No, I don't agree with this uh -huh. view. I think the know your customer norms are very strict for ordinary Okay. Or for ordinary, uh, you know, customers of banks. It could be you or me. But when it comes to these big guys mm -hmm. who or 
guys who pretend to have huge amounts of black money, these same bank officials, mm -hmm. and I refuse to believe that this is only the middle level banking okay. officers of the banks. I'm sure it's being done with the full knowledge and consent of people right at the top. And what are they? They're, they're showing you a way. And you want to hear, I mean, the RBI, you know, has this halo mm -hmm. that, you know, we are one of the best banking regulators in the yeah. world. But what it also exposes, what Cobra mm -hmm. Post Expose has shown is that, look, there's a lot that's wrong with the banking system. And this rot is running right through right the banking through. system, public, private, and also the insurance sector. So now, it's now, not one that minute. the private sector fellows are giving some indu extra inducements to their bankers. No, no, the, it's, they're working in collusion okay. also with the insurance companies. And okay. secondly, here you might say, well, what is the insurance regulator mm -hmm. doing? in this, the IRDA. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's now what is happening is you're working in silos. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. What are the common trends that we see mm -hmm. in the Cobra Post Expose? First, this guy is being told, open many accounts. Mm -hmm. Even if they are in Benami, you know, uh, under all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. fictitious names. But isn't that what most tax planners do? Absolutely. Now, now, now here, here we have bankers uh -huh. or representatives of banks and right. insurance companies right. telling people, uh -huh. this is how you can, you know, how you can Mm -hmm. Easily evade taxes and launder is your it black money. Evasion or is it avoidance? It is evasion because here you are mm -hmm. not only evasion, mm -hmm. it's money laundering. And if okay. you go through the provisions of the Prevention of Money Laundering mm -hmm. Act mm -hmm. of 2002, mm -hmm. th there are three sets of acts mm -hmm. where the rules are being mm -hmm. violated. One is the PML Act, mm -hmm. the other is the Indian Penal Code, okay. the third is the, in the, uh, the, I the, the Income Tax Act as well. Now, now what, what are the trends you are mm -hmm. seeing? You are seeing that. You're saying don't deposit more than 10 lakh mm -hmm. rupees in one financial year. Why? Mm -hmm. Then you don't come into this automatic reporting category. Absolutely. Two, buy gold. But that's gold. not a crime, no Paranjoy. One minute, one minute. Huh. To set up a bank account in somebody else's name? No, no that's, that a is, that that's a crime. That is a crime. That's yes. a straight case mm -hmm. of fraud under the in yeah, Indian Yeah, it's a Binami account. Yes, yes, correct. Now, what is what are you finding? Here are bank officials who are under a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to not only get more deposit, mm -hmm. but also to sell gold coins, right. to sell biscuits and one of the interesting aspects of the thing they're, they're showing how these don't require the use of your PAN, your, mm, your permanent bank, account yeah. number. Then what you do, you, you do these transactions mm. with gold and get some of the money in, in the form of checks. Now it's interesting that this sudden spurt that we've mm. seen mm. in gold Mm -hmm. I mean, are bankers mm -hmm. also conniving in it? You're, no, you're, you're that saying is... that that's a problem of our current account deficit. I'm yeah, saying this and is... also because it was very high inflation. So people correct. wanted to buy gold. Absolutely and maybe correct. banks just helped them along. Because now, there's a slight difference. Now, now were the... bankers being negligent or were they conniving? Was there active collusion? Because uh, even in the Cobra Post expose in the, Joy, yes. the, no transactions seem to have happened. One yes, minute. they seem to be selling correct. the idea. But, but did what... they do it? They may not. You know, so it's like saying uh -huh. that, you know, we are showing you how the way how right. to do this, but since we haven't done it, we should be clean. Okay. But no, I, I think what I, I think what the Cobra Post exposure shows is that this is an endemic rot mm -hmm. in the system. That surely if this banker could show the way for a fictitious character, right. he's probably done it uh -huh. for some real characters. Okay. okay, now we don't know. We, don't we were know. presuming it. Mm -hmm. Now now what, what is typically happening is you all these people who've been suspended, right. they're all middle level officials because right. they've been caught on camera. Right. But again, I think this is, we need to introspect. Yes. I'm surely these middle level yeah. officials couldn't have done what they did without the full knowledge and consent of their superiors in the banks. Now, one minute. Now, now what we are seeing is the way, the modus operandi mm -hmm. that we showed. Many accounts, mm -hmm. many schemes, mm -hmm. banks, insurance mm -hmm. companies mm -hmm. coming together. The other interesting thing, mm -hmm. they're saying, do it in the name of women in your mm. family. Yeah. Show, g g right. Give a certificate right. saying that this has been stridhan. Mm. And, and you know, even if the income tax department mm. raids you, they can't touch you. Mm. you know, in a sense, here are officials who are telling you how to do it. Mm. Now, I think you can say just because there's been no okay. transactions, so what's the big okay. deal? But I think it also reveals how this entire system has is rotten. It's pretty rotten. I mean, I mean, let's accept the fact. We, our banking regulator, RBI, in comparison to its American counterpart, may have done very well in preventing, you know, uh, we don't have these CDSs or uh, whatever. Yeah, credit Colla default swaps. <laughs> credit default swaps and collateral, uh, co collateralized debt obligations and in these exotic derivatives. We might have been spared the worst ravages of, 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 the, uh, of the international financial crisis. But what we see at home, are something that has been going on for a long time. I'll give you another example. This whole thing of showing money as agricultural income. 
Now, we know that agricultural income is not, not taxed. Tax. So, bankers are telling people, look, this is how you have to manipulate the system. Now, we know the system has been manipulated for a long time. What Cobra Post does... So, I think, Paranjo, I must interrupt because we need to take a break okay. at this moment. But we will certainly come back because we're going to continue this discussion and with another very interesting topic on the Coal India divestment. So, please stay with us. Welcome back to this last segment of Policy Watch. The last story is about the government having approved the sale of 10% equity in Coal India Limited, the country's largest coal producer. It's a monopoly producer. The sale is expected to fetch more than 17,000 crores for the government. An interministerial group has approved divestment of 10% stake in Coal India. The offer is expected to be lapped up by the investors. This round of dilution is expected to bring down the government's holdings in the company to 80% from the 90% at present. It is still not clear as to what route will be adopted for the proposed sale, offer for sale or buyback. Offer for sale method is simple and easy to execute. Buyback is possible only if it is permitted in article of association of the concerned parties. The government has asked public sector companies to amend their articles of association to allow buyback of shares. Last time the government raised 15,200 crores by divesting 10% equity in Coal India. The 2010 offer was oversubscribed more than 15 times. However, the image of the company took a beating last year when it failed to meet the demand from power companies. The alleged irregularities in allotment of coal block also has damaged the company's reputation. The government plans to raise rupees 40,000 crores this fiscal by divesting stakes in PSU. The government has plans to sell stakes also in Hydropower Generation Utility NHPC and India's largest oil retailer Indian Oil. Bureau Report, Rajasabha Television. Paranjoy, coal has now become a quite a dirty word. But how do you look at Coal India divestment? Will the government really repeat the success story that we saw of the IPO in 2010? If you remember, the IPO which was placed at 245 rupees, it was listed at 291. And the very next year of trading, it went up to 320. It was hugely oversubscribed. Can the government hope for a repeat, given that all that coal and Coal India, Coalgate, all that it has come to mean, what can we hope for? You know, the stock markets have revived. They've after, I think, a cap of many months, it has crossed the 20,000 mark. But remember, the stock markets have not revived to the level it was in January 2008, Absolutely. which it almost touched also sometime, if you remember, in October 2010. So, yes, the markets have revived. But whether Coal India's uh, this next offering of shares or buyback, whatever you want to call it, offer for sale, I beg your pardon, would have the same kind of response, it's difficult to say, you know, because it happens when, on the day, on the particular time, how, how buoyant the market is. But I think at the end of the day, uh, the problems of the coal industry will not going to disappear. Uh, I mean, the government will get its share of money and, and for the, the, its divestment target. But the problems of, you know, Coal India, the linkages it has with power producers to ensure that adequate coal is provided, those issues are not going to disappear. But because Coal big, India is yeah. the world's biggest producer of coal. It's the biggest corporate entity of its kind. It's India's richest company in terms of market cap and all that. In 2010, when the IPO came out, at that time, you know, the pro Coal India was a monopoly. It still continues to be a monopoly producer. But increasingly, there's talk of the need to kind of reform the system, do away with that monopoly status. Will that in some way affect the kind of response you're going to see from the market? Will people think we're not going to make that kind of money? Will they stay away? What is your sense? I think sense? Colgate has put a huge, you know, put this all back. From the early 70s when coal mining was nationalized, Coal India has had a virtual monopoly. It's had well over 80, 80, 85 percent. It, re it retains that market share. I think all the plans to have these private acreages and private coal box, and the government, you know, it's not been able to get its act together. Now we are going to see many of these private coal blocks have been, you know, the, the allotments are likely to be cancelled. Some of them, are, you know, they haven't been able to mine coal. So I think Coal India's monopoly on the sector is going to remain for quite some time to come. And the, the botched manner in which coal blocks were allotted, despite the fact that the Prime Minister himself wanted an open competitive bidding, a transparent system, I don't think uh, all those who thought that now the private sector is going to play a bigger role in coal mining, I don't think that's going to materialize. And I think the government, if it really wanted that to happen, it should have got its own act together. And we've seen the consequences of whole coal gate, which are still kind of, in a sense, reverberating in the political system. So, Paranjoy, you 
don't have a thumbs up for any of our three stories on the index of industrial production. You're not too hopeful. You think it's too early to call it green shoots. As far as Cobra Post is concerned, you feel there is much more that lies beneath the surface and banks were clearly responsible. There is violation of a number of our laws. And on the last, on Coal India also, you're not too cheerful. So altogether, it's not been too cheerful a week. But nevertheless, thank you so much, Paranjo, for joining us. Thank you so much. And with that, we come to this end of this edition of Policy Watch. Thank you so much. Do join us next week. Thank you.